Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video I'm going to talk about trapping pieces and trapped pieces, pieces which are awkwardly placed and that have no scope. Because I think that's a very important part of uh, your middle game knowledge and something that needs to be improved upon with practice regardless of your level of play and something that isn't uniform and that can't really be explained in one way because it will always depend on the situation on the board and on the exact position but seeing ideas like these might uh, make you a bit more prone to spotting uh, uh, pieces that are trappable in your own games we are going to look at four game examples uh, all of which feature uh, a different type of trapped piece, I don't mean a different piece, but a different type of position, and different reason why, why a piece was trapped, and I hope the, the examples are going to be instructive. To start off with, I'm going to use one opening example, even though this is uh, a middle game video, just to show you one common trap, with pro which probably everybody knows, and this occurs in the Morphe defense in the Roy Lopez, modern Steinitz, uh, and it's the so-called Noah's Ark trap. I'm not sure why the name uh, why it's called that, but anyway, the Noah uh, the Noah's Ark trap is uh, after b5 chasing the bishop away to b3, which is normal, uh, taking on d4. After the knight takes on d4, you take with the e pawn, and now White has to play c3 and continue playing normally. Uh, after he takes d4, uh, the trap is queen takes d4. You can't really take the pawn. If you take the pawn, then your game is lost after c5. Queen to d5, threatening the rook, but now bishop e6, gaining a tempo on the queen. Queen to c6, check, now once again, gaining a tempo on the queen. Bishop d7, and after queen d5, you play the move c4, trapping the bishop. So this is one very common trap, which you should know if you don't know it. And it's easy to spot because people mostly remember the patterns in the openings. And you know where your pieces go, you know the, the pawn moves your opponent has. And everybody knows that black in the role of has b5, has c5, has these advances. So you have to be careful with your b3 bishop. In the middle game, the situation is very much different because most often your pieces get trapped in positions where you don't really know what you're doing. I mean, you know if you understand chess, but you don't know theoretically what you're doing, and you are probably unfamiliar with the piece constellation. Um, this is the game between Luke Van Vili and Jan Timan, played in Vikanze A group uh, in 2003. In this position, white is already better, but there's one huge feature here uh, that basically makes white able to, to trap one of black's pieces. If you look at all of black's pieces, the rooks have scope, the queen has scope, the knight on f6 has several squares, not brilliant, but okay, the bishop is safe, but the e5 knight doesn't really have that many squares. If you look at it, uh, g4 is taken, f3 is taken, d3 is taken, c4 is taken, uh, c6 is taken, uh, d7 is for now free, and it's the only free square, but the problem is that uh, there are some white pieces over here. So let's see what happened. Uh, in the game, uh, Jan Timan played the move rook to d3, and in fact this is already now a losing move, because uh, this uh, removes the defender from the d-file and leaves the knight, which has the d7 square, basically undefended after a series of moves. So let's see what happened. After rook takes d3, the only thing Luke Van Willy did was to exchange the queen and the rook and thus force the knight to be, to be a bad piece. Uh, rook takes d3, queen takes d3. Uh, if you take with the knight, by the way, knight takes d3 fails to bishop c4 and just loses on the spot. So queen takes d3, queen takes d3, knight takes d3. And now rook to d1, chasing the knight back. Now where can the knight go? Uh, it can't take on b2, it can't go to b4, to c5, uh, to f4, doesn't make any sense, f2 is defended, e1 doesn't make sense, c1 doesn't make sense, so the only square is back to the unfortunate e5 square. And after knight to e5, I wonder if you can, if you can spot a simple win. Uh, well, simple, it's not that simple. Uh, I would like you to pause the video if you want to solve this for yourself. It's an interesting exercise. Uh, it does begin with f4. I'm going to tell you that much. Of course, you attack the knight. So pause the video and try to solve it. So, okay. Uh, in the game, f4 was played. And there are two ways to respond to that. Uh, in the game, uh, Jan Timan played bishop h6, which we are going to explain. Uh, another variation is knight e to d7. 
and after e5 you can play knights to d5 sort of defending so that's something you had to calculate so this way you're not really losing a piece but after bishop takes c takes rook takes knight f8 your position is lost and you lost the pawn and your your pieces are very awkward the bishop has no squares the knight has no squares uh, the rook is bad in the corner so this was one way to save a piece but lose a pawn and get a lost position so probably Jan Timan didn't want to enter that he played bishop h6 instead of that which is more active and now uh, obviously if you take the knight black takes the bishop with check and the black is better so the continuation is knight c5 you can also i believe try king to f2 uh, just uh, reinforcing the threat but knight c5 is better simply uh, defending the d7 square knight h5 double attacking this pawn and now simply g3 uh, if you take on g3 then king to f2 and your bishop is defended the knight is hanging and the knight on e5 is hanging so we can't take on g3 uh, and in this position uh, the game actually ended black resigned but the best continuation that i could find was rook to e8 king to f2 and now king to g7 simply giving uh, up the piece and bishop takes e3 king takes e3 rook takes e5 so white uh, is a bishop up uh, let's go back to the original position after bishop to e3 after bishop to e3 the position is already very hard but removing this defender is basically the worst thing uh, Timan could have done apparently the best move is bishop f8 uh, reinforcing this diagonal uh, defending the c5 square and the game should continue f4 chasing the knight away but now the, the the fact is that the rook is still here so now black is able to interpose rook takes d1 rook takes d1 knight e to d7 and after the move e5 knight d5 is a better move because now bishop takes d5 c takes d5 you can't really take with the rook because the queen is defending and black is worse but not losing so removing the defenders the, the defender with uh, rook to d3 was a horrible blunder after rook to d3 rook takes d3 queen takes d3 queen takes d3 knight takes d3 uh, well the point of this video is to uh, strengthen your thinking uh, your strategic thinking in a way that you can spot that this knight is a bad piece in the position and that it doesn't have any squares if you think a piece is awkward try to uh, try to move it to any possible square on the board in your head if you don't see that many squares that, then it might be easy to exploit and you will you would be surprised at how often people miss the chances to trap and win pieces or at least push them to the corner and make them bad okay so that was the first example and i think this is the hardest one but it's also the most instructive one <clears throat> uh, the next example i'm going to go uh, I'm going to put the position a bit before the, the critical position. This is Portish Tal, Moscow 67, uh, a typical uh, King's Indian fianchetto. Uh, and after e5, we have d5. And now, of course, uh, well, you should play knight e7. It's the King's Indian, so your pieces aren't going to have too much space anyway. Knight e7, e4, bishop c8, retreating, but black still has his ideas of f5. However, after d5, uh, Mikhail Tal played knight a5. And now, I think it's clear, clear to see which piece is going to be a bad piece in this position. Uh, the game continued e4, uh, bishop g4, queen to d3, c5. Uh, and now the knight, well, how many squares does, does the knight have? Once again, think about uh, the bad piece. It's clear that the knight is bad here. It doesn't have b3, c4, uh, c6, or b7 so not a single square the queen is defending it for now so if, if you can manage to attack the knight twice then you're going to be able to capture it it's, it's as simple as that so Lajos Portish plays a logical move bishop d2 now uh, the knight is uh, attacked and if you can manage to get your knight out of the way and uh, play the move queen to c3 then you can win the knight uh, knight h5 was played which is well Okay, typical King's Indian preparing f5, but he doesn't really have time for that. Knight to c2 was played, uh, bishop d7, knight to b5, uh, initiating this exchange because it actually helps white's plans. We have bishop b5, c b5, and now uh, this is the critical position. White is better. White is better because white has more space. It's the King's Indian, so the engines love white, but even from a human perspective, this is... Uh, too much space and too much activity, especially because these knights on a5 and h5 
h5 okay it's the king's indian knight and it's going to be on h5 very often but the knight on a5 doesn't really do much even if you don't manage to embarrass or win that knight it's still a bad piece with absolutely no scope and any b3 would would restrain the knight and that means that the knight doesn't have c6 or or c4 and it's a bad piece for the rest of the game however uh, there's a chance for black to go badly wrong here and and lose the piece so the only move in this position that i can see is b6 if you play b6 your knight is defended it can read out via b8 uh, b uh, b7 d8 Probably f5 and then knight f6, knight g5 or something like that. It doesn't have a bright future, but at least it's not dead. After cb5, however, Mihal Tal played a horrible move which just loses a piece. a6. And I wonder if you can uh, spot the winning move here. Here, once again, pause the video if you'd like to. Uh, this one is simpler, but it's a great, uh, it's a great pattern which you should remember. So pause the video if you'd like to. Uh, so the thing is... Uh, once again, black is able to play b6. If black is able to play b6, then the knight is defended. So how do you stop b6? You play b6 yourself. It doesn't matter that the pawn is hanging, because after queen takes b6, you can now play queen c3 and the knight is lost. The knight has no squares. So after queen c3, queen b5, queen takes a5, queen takes b2, rook f to c1, in two or three moves, Mikhail Tal resigned. It's pointless and embarrassing. To continue playing like this but the whole thing started after d5 knight a5 which in itself doesn't lose but you're basically condemned to have a bad piece throughout the game so the thing i would like you to to take from this example is once your opponent makes a move like knight a5 once you see a piece that seems unnatural that seems awkward if you've seen a lot of chess games and you have and then your your intuition is going to be mostly correct in telling you which pieces look awkward once you see that just spend a few minutes trying to embarrass that piece it doesn't have to be on your own time you can do that while your opponent is thinking and very often you're going to see some great ideas okay uh, the next example is my favorite uh, it's fairly complex but uh, but it's easy to understand the, the, the trapping of the piece. This, the position in itself, I'm sorry, that was the canon, it's noon in Zagreb. Uh, the position uh, in itself is complicated, but the piece trap is, is less so. So, okay, uh, the thing is here that both, both pieces are hanging. In the position, uh, after h, uh, h takes g4, bishop d8 was played. Uh, taking the bishop would just result in taking the knight, and I mean, it's it's not that good. Bishop d8 was played after h takes g4, and after bishop d8, uh, white is to play. White can uh, take the knight, and after bishop take after pawn takes bishop, the position is sort of equal. But uh, in this position, Movsesian found a great move, and the point of the move isn't. Uh, to, to checkmate the white, the black king isn't to win a piece, it's to trap the bishop on d8. He is using the fact that the bishop is now stuck on d8. And this one, I mean, this piece is awkward, definitely. As in the last example, the bishops doesn't belong to a square from which they control only one other square. This is a weird bishop. And especially in conjunction with all, with all of the white pieces around it, this should get your mind going. So what he does is remarkable. Uh, he sacks the exchange, rook takes d7, because now the knight is loose. Uh, and of course, it's it will be rook and bishop for knight and bishop. So it is a, a, an, an exchange sacrifice. So after king takes rook, he takes on f5. Okay, he took on f5. The bishop is hanging, but now the point is that the d8 bishop is trapped. And now I wonder if you can spot the two simple moves. Simply e6 check, king c8, e7. The bishop, uh, the bishop is dead, and white is going to have two knights uh, for the rook, which is winning. In a few moves, uh, Movsesian won, Leko resigned. So coming back to this position, it was fairly complex. After g4, h takes g4, h takes g4, bishop to d8. You have to see the idea, uh, but it's... I think when you consider this piece a bad, bad piece, then you can see that if, wow, if I could only play e6, e7, the bishop would be trapped because my knight is controlling uh, the e7 square. How do I play e6? The bishop takes for now. 
Firstly, I can remove the bishop. Secondly, if I take this knight, my two pawns are going to be connected. So if I manage to take g takes f5, then e6 is a strong move. And put all of that together and uh, get a strong player on the board, he's going to find rook takes d7. Perhaps in your own games you're not going to find such brilliant tactics, but examples like this are going to make you stronger. So rook d7, king d7, gf5, fg5. After g5, black can either not take the bishop on g5 or he can take the bishop on g5, so it's better to take. f takes, e6 check, uh, king c8, e7 winning the bishop. Okay, uh, and our last example is uh, what happens to me. Uh, usually, I don't necessarily lose the piece, but I lose the game because I misplaced the piece. And it's very easy to misplace rooks. Uh, I've actually lost two games last December because I played weird rook lifts and got my rooks in my opponent's position where they did nothing. Now, if you look at this rook, it's, I mean, it's a bad piece. It's just a bad piece. Okay, this is the game Rajabov Shirov uh, from Linares 2008. So how do you stop uh, this rook from ever moving? Uh, he starts with a very strong move, f4. Now, uh, bishop h4 was played. If after f4 you try to move the rook out of the way, let's say rook to c5, then this move would restrain your dark squared bishop too much and your bishop would have no scope. So if he was choosing between two evils, whether he should move the rook or move the bishop. So he decided to play bishop h4, give the bishop some scope. But now... Uh, pause the video and uh, try to find the move which embarrasses the rook. You don't win the rook immediately, but how do you make this rook dead for the rest of the game? Okay, uh, the move was b4. Uh, b4 simply means that the black rook on d5 hasn't got a single square. And now this rook can't move. If you can manage to keep it, keep it there, you're virtually playing a rook up apart uh, on the fifth rank. So... On the whole board, your opponent doesn't have a rook. So the game continued rook c8. Now we have a4, restraining the rook even further, preventing the move, uh, preventing the move uh, b, uh, b5. We have rook c3, infiltrating the position. And now, uh, of course, black can see that if white manages to get in uh, the move uh, bishop to e4, then the rook is going to be trapped. So the point of a4 was to take away the square b5 from the black rook. So now, if in the last position after rook c8, white had played bishop e4, then here, okay. You can't play a4 because b4 is hanging. So after a4, bishop e4 is a threat. So rook c3, preparing to sacrifice the exchange. Okay, king to b2 was played. And now f5, g takes f5, rook takes d3 has to be played. Let me just go back to this position after rook to c3. What happens after bishop e4 here? I'm not too certain. Wait. There must be something here. Oh yeah, there's there's this trick. But I think it's still winning. Wait. Yeah, okay, this is what happens when you don't look at all the options. Okay, a4. Rook to c3. Bishop e4. Yeah, I was looking at... He played king b2 in the game, trying to get away from these dangerous variations, but after bishop e4, the problem is d3, but I didn't think it was such a big, big problem. Let's see, can he just... Yeah, he can't take the rook now because he takes here with check winning the other rook. So, okay, yeah, I'm sorry for not looking at this variation before, but I didn't see that bishop uh, e4 was met uh, with d3. So anyway, after a4, rook c3, king to b2 simply gets away from the check. So now this isn't the check and it's much better white can take here. So now bishop e4 is once again a threat. And now uh, after bishop e4 is a threat, of course, black plays f5. And now we have g takes f5 and now your, your rook is trapped. Bishop e4 is coming. d3 is not a threat. You have to take and basically Alexei Shirov takes on d3 to be able to, to win f5. c d3, rook takes f5. The game is lost. Should have lost in a couple of moves. Let's go back to the original position. Uh, it happened after a queen exchange. Okay, he was going to lose the d5 pawn. So queen takes d5, queen takes d5, rook takes d5. And now that the rook took on d5, he started restraining the pieces. f4 keeps an eye uh, on the bishop. g5 would be a very strong move. So bishop h4. B4, the rook has no squares. The rook has no squares. 
rook c8, a4. This means that the bishop doesn't have to keep control of b5, it can go to e4 to win the rook. Rook c3, once again, if bishop e4 immediately, uh, d3 is a strong move because d takes c2 is with check, winning the rook. So king b2 prophylaxis uh, to be able to meet d3 with simply taking the rook. And now f5 lashing out, there's nothing to do, g takes f5. I was looking at the move uh, g5 because I didn't see why this isn't better. Uh, because you simply keep the rook trapped. I mean, you don't have to win it necessarily. I thought it would be enough to restrain the bishop as well, because now the bishop doesn't have scope, and you can simply play rook d2, rook e2, and infiltrate the position. So you're basically playing two pieces up. But I guess it's more straightforward just to take and to threaten bishop e4. Rook takes d3, c takes d3. A winning game. Uh, <clears throat> so... Be careful with your rooks. As I said, I, I had played a couple of very weird rook lifts uh, and I lost two games, uh, which I remember because of rook lifts. But I usually, when I play rook lifts, I try to play for a strong attack, which normally doesn't happen. So be careful doing that. Okay, uh, I hope you like the examples. I hope they helped uh, find more games like these. I wouldn't recommend uh, just looking... Um, at books and trying to find thematic positions, I would recommend you analyze games of strong players and try to see whether they had a chance to trap something or whether some pieces were loose, why traps didn't work, why traps could have worked, etc., to, to be able to develop your own ideas. Looking at positions and thinking about pieces that could be embarrassed is the best way to, to improve at that, in my opinion. Uh, thank you very much. Once again, thanks for the support and the kind words and the comments and everything. Uh, see you very soon. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.